I just see that as a So welcome and good morning, everyone. So it's a great pleasure to, to introduce my longtime friend, DJ Balazubermanian. He's a professor at the Penn University at Philadelphia and a fellow of the American Physical Society. He has been working on many different fields from string theory, quantum field theory, neuroscience. And uh, you can also see him in a, in a recent episode of the Netflix series, Explain It, Explicando, where uh, he talks about time. But today he'll talk about space. So DJ, thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thanks very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here in Brazil. And thanks to Carolina and to uh, Jefferson for inviting me. I'm really enjoying myself very much. So my talk today <clears throat> is on imagining space. And um, is, there an <clears throat> is there an echo there by any chance? No, maybe it's OK. And uh, the, precisely what I mean by that will become uh, clear as I begin to talk. So let's start by talking about, I hear an echo. Do you hear an echo? OK. So let's start by discussing uh, what is space. So you know, since ancient times, uh, people have understood space as a kind of stage on which things have been located. And there have been many different concepts of what space is. And so people have various cultures have variously thought about space as infinite or finite, flat or round, continuous to speak centered on Earth, famously, or centered along the sun, or even centered nowhere. So people have conceived of the cosmos as a whole, as a kind of space of relationships with entities. So here's such a picture. This is a mandala from Nepal from about a thousand years ago, where there's a sort of concept of what the universe is with all the different entities that populate the universe that live in various geometric relationships with each other. So there's something about the way humans think that's fundamentally spatial in this way. But the way in which we process and define those spatial relationships really can differ. Um, and uh, it's key, of course, that you can move in space and between spaces. But, you know, for example, in Mesoamerica and Australia, people talk about four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. But in India, at least in some parts of India, it's a big place, you know, at various points, there have been 10 cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, in between them, up, down. Well, I mean, very clearly, you can sort of define what you mean by space in different sorts of ways. So in physics, <clears throat> our modern understanding of space derives in the end from Descartes, or largely from Descartes in some ways. Um, you know, he lived from 1596 to 1650 and gave us the modern notion of space in terms of Cartesian coordinate systems. So you know perfectly well what that is. You define set of real numbers as coordinates for space with a certain number of dimensions. You can vary the number of dimensions between one and if you're a string theorist, 10 or 11 or something. But anyhow, uh, this is the kind of thing we do in physics. And of course, you know, even that understanding evolves. We know perfectly well that about 100 years ago, Einstein taught us that the perception of this entity over here, this Cartesian coordinate system, if you like, um, is uh, uh, the perception is relative to your state of motion. And that in particular, space and time, uh, which really does feel very different from space, you know, if you like psychologically, um, can be mixed in space-time. And what's more, that matter can warp the whole thing together. It's even crazier than that in modern physics, just to emphasize that you know, these funny conceptions of space are not just in your head. I mean, maybe it is really crazier. We've learned very recently in the last 25 years or so that space can even be emergent. So for example, in the ADS-CFT correspondence, gravitating spaces emerge as a description of some non-gravitating, uh, non strongly coupled conformal field theory. And there's a way in which you reorganize uh, non-gravitating dynamics in D dimensions in terms of gravitating dynamics in D plus one dimensions. That's the thing I give colloquia on too, but not today. Instead, today I want to think about how the sense of place and space gets produced inside your head by the circuits that are there. So we're all animals. And practically, you know, animal life is practically defined by motion. If we didn't move, we'd be plants, right? And our lifestyles would be completely different. So in order to have that style of life, to be able to move in the world, you need to do various things. You need to be able to learn the geometry of new spaces. All animals do this. You have to be able to imagine somehow where you are in that space, 
And then you have to be able to imagine how to get, get elsewhere, right? Planning for navigation. That's critical for you know, the pursuit of animal life. The funny thing is that inside your head, you don't have you know, a, uh, a map to look at, so to speak. You know, this location here, this auditorium, uh, this is my living room, you know, this kind of thing, is an abstract pattern of neurons firing. You know, there's some pattern inside your head, that's here. There is some other pattern of neurons firing. And they, uh, this is called, this, so these patterns of neurons firing that maintain your sense of space, your map, is called a cognitive map defined by Tolman many decades ago of location. And you're supposed to be able to plan in this kind of abstract representation inside your head in terms of patterns of neural firing, you're supposed to be able to, able to plan a trajectory that takes this pattern of firing to that pattern of firing, and that's a navigational plan, right? So in this sense, in your head, space is always emergent. It's not really there. It's an abstraction relating the different kinds of patterns of activity that exist inside uh, the brain. So um, a uh, whole chunk of my work over the last few years have been trying to understand how this happens. So this is work at the interface of physics and of neuroscience. You know, neuroscientists, of course, think a lot about this. A Nobel Prize went for this kind of thinking, uh, this kind of work about seven years ago. But very often in neuroscience, the, you know, there's a lot of data, but uh, they appreciate people like us physicists who understand how to talk about emergent behaviors coming in and helping to build models and theorize about uh, how the effects are happening. Now, I'm, so how many people in this room have actually done any neuroscience or know anything about neuroscience? So you, I, in an audience this size, I would have expected, if it's a physics audience, maybe one. And Jefferson, oh, two, two, oh, you're above the mean. Um, so, so for that reason, <laughs> for that reason uh, I'm going to start by giving you the 15-minute you know, introduction to all of neuroscience, so that we're all on the same page regarding vocabulary. Okay? So we're going to set that foundation up. And then we're going to take a couple of problems and talk about how a physicist can approach problems like how the brain represents space using these ideas about circuits. So my goal is to convince as many of you as possible, students and postdocs, to switch over to that field. It's more fun than whatever you're doing right now. Right, so that's the goal. So here we go. So we're going to start by talking about circuits of the brain. So all circuits of the brain, well, the whole brain, is built of cells like everything else in the body. The cell is a unit of life, like Rika Albert was saying in her talk yesterday. Um, and like all cells, cells have you know, cell membranes that surround the interior, they've got cell bodies and so on. But of course, the purpose of a neuron is to compute and communicate, so it has very specializations for that. It has these input wires called dendrites, and messages from the presynaptic neuron arrive at the dendrites and get incorporated. There's a cell body that produces responses to the neural input, and then the output is an electrical pulse, we'll talk more about that in a moment, which passes down the axon and then comes to these axon terminals where there are synapses, and the synapses emit neurotransmitter, a chemical communicating agent, which then diffuses to the next neuron, and then the message continues. So that's how everything in your brain works. Now, um, what are these electrical potentials like? Well, you see, so the way it happens is that um, a, a neuron typically has a resting potential of about minus 70 millivolts relative to the surrounding medium. It maintains it like that using ionic pumps and you know, stuff like this. And then if there's an input into the dendrites, it opens an ion channel. There's beautiful, beautiful biophysics done about this. Actually, the first Nobel Prize in biophysics went to Hodgkin and Huxley for working this out in detail uh, back in the 50s, 60s or something. So well, anyhow, these channels open, these uh, pores in the cell membrane open, uh, basically some molecules in this conformation, and ions begin to float in as positive ions. As they float in, the potential rises, and when it rises, there's a very interesting dynamical process. You can summarize the behavior of the neuron in terms of a dynamical system with various kinds of attractors and runaway processes and so on. And you cross some threshold, and there's a positive feedback process that causes the voltage to rush up very, very sharply to peak. And then some other kind of channel opens, producing the reverse. There's a negative feedback channel that opens, and you get boom, you come down, and then you return to rest, and then you repeat. Uh, that's how neurons produce their signals. So you get these very narrow uh, pulses of electricity called action potentials and, or, or spikes. And that's how you compute and communicate. Every thought you've ever had, every sensation you've ever had arises from these electrical pulses. So much so, well, okay, so the discovery that electricity powered the brain goes back all the way back to the uh, origins of the theory of electricity. 
So, you know, so shortly after Alessandro Volta you know, built his battery, you know, what are you going to do? First time you get a battery, you're going to shock your friend, right? So the Galvanis, uh, uh, husband and wife team, whose names I can't remember, first names. Anyway, the Galvanis were sitting around, I think, cooking frog's legs at their kitchen. And one of them stuck uh, Volta's battery across a frog's leg, and it went boom. It kicked. And they were like, wow. And um, uh, that was the discovery of what was called animal electricity. So in those days, people began to wonder if electricity was the vital spark of life, all of life, just life was electricity. And so, um, and again, so we pursued this idea of vitalism, which led to experiments like they would take, you know, executed criminals. In those days, you know, you could get executed for stealing a loaf of bread, you know, brutal times. Um, so they would, they would take an executed criminal and, you know, pump them full of electricity and the body would go, you know, like this. And they would think, oh my God, I reanimated the dead. This is the source of things like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, you know, the famous, maybe the first of the science fiction books. And, um, uh, but of course they were wrong, right? Electricity, the only reason why dead bodies are animated by electricity is your muscles are all enervated by nerves, by neurons. And if you pump them full of electricity, the neuron will fire and the neuron fires your muscles will start doing stuff. That does not mean you're alive. Anyhow, you get the point, electricity runs the brain. But of course a single neuron can't compose poetry, can't feel love, you know, stuff like this. It has to be collections of neurons. So let's go to the complete other scale. This is the whole brain. This is your head, you know, like this. This is the whole head over here, you can see. And, um, um, and it turns out that at the scale of the whole brain, all kinds of different kinds of computations that you need to do, the procedures you, you would have had to write to make a simulation of a you are segregated in different parts of the brain. So for example, the back of your brain uh, here is what's called the visual cortex. Here we're looking at the cortex, which is a layer on the outside of the brain. And the visual cortex, you know, is involved with stuff like, well, you know, all of vision. This is why if you fall and bash the back of your head, you know, your vision is blurry, you know, you see stars, stuff like this. You have a bruise on the circuits and they're not working as well, right? And so, so that's what's going on. So deep inside the head here. So over here, there's an area called, uh, where is it? This is the speech area is Broca's area and uh, that controls speech. So, you know, this idea that uh, function is localized, which is very convenient for people like us, for physicists, right? Uh, let me say why it's convenient. If I told you there are 100 billion neurons in the brain and they all collectively are some ghastly gargantuan neural network and somehow everything emerges, this would be a problem that'd be sort of incredibly hard to solve. But super convenient that I know that there are circuits here that involve speech, circuits here that involve vision, because the smaller pieces of the puzzle that you can solve, right? So the discovery of this, what's called localization of function, goes back all the way to the Egyptians. There's a papyrus manuscript where the author describes that, you know, they have people who get bashed on this side of the head, and, you know, they stop being able to talk. That's probably because they damaged this piece of the brain, but everything else works, right? Or this person has a stroke, and the left side of their face sags, but the right side doesn't. That's because only part of the brain was damaged, that kind of thing. So the modern rediscovery of the localization of function is due to a Dr. Broca. Uh, Jefferson will remember Rue Broca in the uh, left, <laughs> in the fifth arrondissement in, in Paris. And uh, so this Dr. Broca had a patient who had, I think a nail or something pass into this part of their head. And it's now called Broca's area. And this patient couldn't produce speech anymore, but understood speech perfectly well and lived a ripe old age. And so then further studies of that, uh, going down to the modern times, have uh, discovered this localization function. We're gonna be interested in a piece of the brain that's sort of in the middle there. It's called the hippocampal formation and contains many of the circuits that facilitate spatial cognition. So we'll talk about more of that in the middle. Um, is that a question? Oh, no, okay. I thought somebody raised their hand. So we're gonna ask if there was a question. Anyhow, so that's the whole brain, right? Now, if you take any one of these areas, and now we're gonna zoom in, going back down to the scale of single neurons, you'll find that if I look at this area, let's say here, there's a strip down the side of your head that controls your body, that's the motor cortex. And you might think, oh, well, that's some gigantic neural network in the style of deep learning, you press go, it learns to control your body. But it isn't really. If you go and look, the circuits over here, at the top of your head, control your knee. And the circuits towards the side of your head control your face. This is why a stroke here damages your face, but you can walk perfectly well. A stroke somewhere there will damage your ability to walk, but you, won't, but you control your face perfectly well. So I'm just trying to say that one layer down, one level down in scale, there's still localization of function this way. It goes further. 
here is an absolutely beautiful drawing by Ramoni Cajal, um, uh, you know, basically founder of neuroscience. He did these, he was an artist. Uh, he did these beautiful, beautiful drawings under a microscope of the structure of neural circuits. So here is a picture, early picture of the retina, uh, three layers. This is your classic three layer neural network. This is the origin of all of deep learning, right? It comes from circuits like this. So here are the first layer of the photoreceptors. Their job is to transcribe light into electrical signals. The second layer are the bipolar cells, which do some kind of analog processing. There are about 10 different kinds of bipolar cells and you know four kinds of rods and cones. And then down here are the so-called ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells are the output cells of the retina. And these output cells, they extract features from the world just like you would do in a computer. You know, you break open any machine vision algorithm. And the first thing it does is it extracts features from the world, and the edges and corners and, you know, uh, colored spots and bright spots and stuff like this. That's exactly what this thing does. There are cells that respond to left to right motion, right to left motion, motion 120 degrees, red minus green, blue minus yellow, you know, these kinds of visual features. And these types of cells, the ganglion cells, extract that information from the world and put that into these output wires, uh, these axons. And these axons, the bundle of axons coming out from these things is called the optic nerve. And everything you do visually, oh, thank you so much, is uh, based on the digital signals. These are all digital signals that are sort of like spikes. Uh, that the eye sends to the brain. So I have some old paper basically showing through measurements that you get about an Ethernet cable's worth of information uh, from the eye to the brain. Okay, so this is all of it. So even that actually is a cartoon. I'm hoping you're trying to starting to see the kind of diversity involved in these circuits. So this is the next picture is trying to illustrate why this stuff is so intimidating to a person like me, like a physicist. So, you know, I grew up thinking, well, you know, you should simplify your systems as much as possible, right? So give me a nice sodium chloride crystal, right? It's sort of all very well organized. And even that's getting complicated. Give me the Ising model and I can make some progress, that kind of thing. So you take this circuit, the retina, you're as simple as it's going to get, and you break it open and you find out that at least 65 different types of cells, okay? So you have the uh, rods and cones and these bipolar cells, which I mentioned, and the ganglion cells, which I mentioned, this feed forward pathway. But laterally, running horizontally, there's this immensely diverse population of horizontal cells and interneurons of different kinds. These are called amacrine cells. And look at them. This is pictures of their profile, and they all look different. And there's a rule in biology that form follows function. So by seeing that they look different, you can pretty much guess that they're doing different things. These are like different circuit elements. So it's like, you know, when you're doing VLSI design, you have a repertoire, and you, you know, you, you have your resistor, you have a diode, you have a transistor, you know, you have a capacitor, you have a handful of things, and you hook them together to produce the functions you want. The retina is using 65 different kinds of, of circuit elements. Why? So one of the questions that the kind of thing that, you know, we as physicists can ask is, why would you do that? Why would evolution select for all of these cell types? Because they're conserved. You go and look in every vertebrate retina, you find them again and again. So they weren't, didn't happen just kind of randomly because they've been selected for over time. So the theory of the computation going on here should somehow illuminate that. Let me emphasize how important these things are. You might think, ah, it's just there because it's there. So, you know, how to say this. So the world of photons arriving in the eye contains an immense amount of information, a very small fraction of which is relevant for animal behavior. The job of this stuff is to remove the irrelevant so that the brain with its limited resources can focus on the relevant. To make an analogy, you know, uh, someone asked Michelangelo uh, how he managed to, you know, sculpt the sculpture of David that's sitting around Florence. And he said, well, you know, David happened to be already inside the marble. I just removed everything else, right? So these cells here, all these types of cells, and their functions are removing the everything else that you don't care about. So very, very interesting. And by the way, if you solved this, if you understood the circuit, there is absolutely nothing stopping you from building the retina in silicon and curing the blind, right? You could just do it if you knew what these things were doing and why. Okay, just, just putting that on the table. It's very important to understand this. So our goal here eventually, yeah, we're getting there, is to understand the circuits that underlie our sense of space. So um, I promised you there was this region of the brain called the uh, uh, subiculum. A great deal is known about the logic diagram. I'm not going to work through this logic diagram in complete detail. But you know, 
you certainly need sensory input. So there are two areas of the brain, the perirhinal and the postrhinal cortex that are charged with bringing sensory input, you know, sound, smells, you know, touch, all this kind of stuff into this part of the brain. You certainly need movement input, right? Because that matters for knowing where you are, your navigational plan, and there are various uh, bits of the brain that do that. Then you need a way of producing maps and navigational plans, and the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus do that. We'll be focusing on those today. And they're all connected up in this funky circuit. There are many types of cells, some of which I will talk about. There are border cells that respond when you're near borders. We'll talk about those. There are boundary vector cells, which we'll talk less about. They respond if there's a border or boundary at a certain angle. Um, there are head direction cells that respond when your head is aligned in a particular direction relative to some absolute reference frame. There are speed cells that sort of respond with firing rate, tells you how fast you're going. Place cells that respond depending upon where you are. Landmark cells, so on, so on, so on. So one of the outstanding questions in this area is the, well, there's several. One is the logic of the circuit. Why would you pick these as your circuit elements, not something else? Another one is mechanistic. How do you produce these outputs from whatever sensory inputs are there in the world? How do you sort of compose these things? So there are many questions of this kind that are ripe for the picking. There's enormous amounts of experimental data. It's just growing so quickly in this field because it's young. And there's very little in the way of theory. Well, compared to little in the way of theory compared to a field that's well developed like uh, most of our fields in physics. Okay. So how would you go about doing this? So, you know, I've been basically saying we need to build a theory of the circuit repertoire and vision and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So how would you even go about devising a theory? We need a method, a way of approaching this problem. So one way, I mean, there may be many, but one way of approaching this is to kind of think about what is the purpose of the circuit repertoire? Well, it's a memory, right? Each circuit element here is a memory of a computation that has a predictive value for behavior. And I can talk about the environment and I can talk about the animal behavior. I can ask what information in the world is relevant for the behavior. I know it's learned over evolutionary time, so I could develop some kind of theory of self-modifying or self-organizing circuits to learn this kind of stuff. And then it's encoded in the genome and the development of program. Almost nothing has been done by people about thinking about the encoding in the genome and the development of the program. So you could take this perspective, and you know, I like the phrase, what I do for a living, as saying, I ask the question, what organizational principles or laws, if you will, control the computational and information processing repertoires of the brain? So for those who are interested in sort of a, uh, a sort of more bedside reading uh, version of this kind of thing, there's a very nice book by Peter Sterling and Simon Laughlin called Principles of Neural Design. Um, and, you know, uh, the thinking person's uh, book about this kind of stuff. So you'll, you'll enjoy reading it if you get a hold of it. Anyhow, so... Of course, you can't just, why don't you build the, just the best possible circuit to do this kind of thing? Well, there are many constraints. So this is a classic kind of constrained optimization problem. On the one hand, you want to do certain things well, you know, see well, move well, remember space well. On the other hand, you know, you're working with certain kinds of elements and there are constraints. Um, there are many you could enumerate. Let me enumerate a couple, right? So one is simply the cost of computation, right? So, you know, your brain is 2% of your body weight. But it's fully 20% of the metabolic load. So it's about 10 times as expensive as muscle when you're working out. It's seriously expensive. Um, it's also very packed. We'll say less about that today. So millimeter cubed of wire. So that's like if you put your four fingers together, that little space in between is a millimeter cube. It contains four kilometers of wire. This is just absolutely jam-packed. Oh, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, if you ask how much power the brain consumes, this number is a bit out of date. It's somewhere between 12 and 20 watts. So your brain consumes very little power, on the other hand, in some sense, even though it's so expensive relative to the rest of the body. And the reason that's significant is, by the way, my laptop that I'm giving this talk on consumes about 80 watts. So another reason to understand this in detail is, you know, the, my laptop doesn't give talks or write poetry. So, so, well, you know, what is it that's going on in my head that with, you know, 12 to 20 watts, I can do that? So that is a question of tremendous interest technologically and in computer science there are, you know, Intel, IBM, all these places have projects going on in neuromorphic computing precisely for this reason. Your head is doing something that's sort of vastly more efficient for certain kinds of tasks. So what is it as part of the game here to understand? So, you know, so here's, let me put these things together. On the one hand, I've said it's an expensive circuit. On the other hand, I've said somehow it's fairly efficient uh, or very efficient. And the other hand, I've said that there are all of these circuit elements we'd like to give a theory of. So maybe these two things are related. So you might suppose that the brain achieves its efficiency 
by adapting its circuits to the structure of the world, and then self-organizing and learning to adapt to the changes. So the basic idea here is kind of maybe the maybe an analogy to make is the kind of thing that people say in sociology and economics, right? You know, back in the day, we were all hunter-gatherers, we all dug the ground, made the houses, you know, hunted the animals and all that stuff. And you know, society got along. Then we uh, specialized our, our, our functions. You know, some people uh, bake the bread, some people you know, bank the money, some people make the shoes, and so on. And if you do that, each unit that does each of these things becomes better at that because they can focus on it. And you squeeze out greater efficiencies from society. I don't know if that's a completely valid theory of social organization, but you hear it. So in that kind of sense, you might imagine that adapting the circuit elements to the different things that need to be done, you know, specializing them, and then having them communicate as a community, if you like, inside your head, would be a more effective or efficient organization to bring. So that's the kind of approach I tend to take and then try to sort of prove that the circuit or, or understand the circuit repertoire in that way. So let me set that principle out like this. So the principle that I've just tried to say is the principle of efficient use of resources. The idea is that the brain exploits the average structure of the world to efficiently allocate its limited computational resources to maximize gain for the organism. So then your theory is going to have the structure that you're going to say you have so many resources, you got to figure out how to allocate them in order to solve the problem well. So that's a problem that I can write down in some way if I could define words like efficiently and computational resources and what gain means and things like that. If I can define those mathematically, maybe I can make some progress, right? Just to draw a picture of what this is. So for example, if this retina, if the rectangle is the space of all of vision, that you need to cover, then you might imagine each of these colored blobs to be like one circuit element that's taking a little piece of the visual space and processing it. And then you have all of these little pieces, right? all the different, let's say, rat retinal ganglion cell types are looking at little features in the world, and then they all cooperate in some way to put together a mosaic of what the world is. So that's the picture. And so the question is, how do you break a big job into small jobs? Anybody who programs extensively, I like programming, knows perfectly well that when we program, we think like that, right? There's a big job you need to do. What do you do? I immediately break it up into little pieces that I can handle. And I write a really nice code to do that. I define its interface that I know what's going to go in, what's going to go out. And then that's how I structure the program. It's an efficient way of doing things in some ways. Um, and I would love to know the anal uh, make precise the analogy between that process of writing an algorithm and this. But this I'm going to phrase more in information theory terms. So, Here's the second principle, learning and self-organization. That's my daughter when she was very small. She was always very intense and learned very well and things like this. Okay, so like Aruna here, um, neural circuits must self-organize their architecture through dynamics and learning. And they need to do this because if you come with a fixed structure that you wire in from the genome and development, you know, the world may change. The world's changing all the time. So the average structure that you're adapted to may not be exactly appropriate. So you need to be able to adapt the circuit all the time. This is stuff you can only get from experience because the world changes. So we're not going to talk about that much today, basically because there isn't time. But you know, there's a second colloquium to be given <laughs> on, on, on all of that and its relationship with things like deep learning and so on. OK, very good. We're about to start. Any questions on your, you can tell everybody that you now know neuroscience. So questions? That's either because I was super clear or I talked so fast that nobody understood anything. So there was the soothing wave of sound. Um, I'm going to assume that you understood everything since you didn't ask me a question. Jefferson asked me a question. Sure? Oh, okay, great. Wonderful. So we're also <laughs> short on time because we started late. Right. So um, that was the introduction. Now I want to get over to the core problem that I started with, which is the problem of imagining space. So I'm a theorist. So I'm going to think like a theorist. So going back, here is a place, my living room. And you might ask the question, what is place, this place? And when I go into this room, I instantly recognize it. I, I can close my eyes and walk around this room without bumping into anything. How do I know where I am? Uh, how are the abstract neural pa firing patterns organized that tell me where I am in this room and how they change? How do they change when I move around? So those are the kinds of questions I'm interested in. I'm going to start being a theorist in the ridiculous way of oversimplifying the world, right? This is, so I'm going to suppose, so I'm going to, rather than saying going and looking at the data first, I'm just going to step back and say, well, suppose I wanted to build a neural representation of space. What would I do, right? So imagine that the world, the whole world, 
is an eight meter linear track, okay? And now let's further suppose that, um, uh, let's further suppose that you need one meter resolution in that track. That's because you're an animal that's a, I don't know, capybara sized, very appropriate. Uh, I saw three of them on the lawn out there. Um, and the person sitting next to me said they're like squirrels. This country, amazing. Okay, so fine. So uh, we need one meter resolution. So how could you create such a map? Well, one way of doing it would be to assign in your head a cell to fire when you're in each of these blocks. So for example, let's suppose you're cell three and let's suppose this, uh, uh, the cursor is the mouse. You might hear an Nothing, 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 nothing. And when the mouse gets here, drrr, right? The cell is firing like that. So this is a scheme. It's a unary code for space, if you like, and with one meter resolution. And this requires eight neurons. In fact, in the hippocampus, there may be cells that act a bit like this, but actually it's increasingly clear that they're actually more complicated. They're sort of context cells, you know, They'll change how they respond depending on the smells and the sound and what you want to do and stuff. So, and space is one prominent context. So I'm not gonna talk about those today for that reason. There's a separate discussion we should have of that. I want to talk about pure spatial coding. Okay, so this is an eight meter linear track. Let me point out that the number of neurons you need grows linearly here in the size of the space. Now, here's a slightly more efficient representation of a one dimensional world. So I'm going to imagine this is a little complicated, so, so you should ask me if there's a question here, okay? So I'm going to take the room, and I'm going to take the biggest scale, the whole room, divide the room into two parts, and assign one neuron, the blue neuron here, or the zero neuron, to fire if you're in the left half of the room, and the second neuron, the orange neuron, to fire in the right half of the room, okay? So that, of course, if, if, depending on which neuron fires, you know which half of the room you're in, right? So that isn't the resolution you wanted, you wanted a finer resolution. So what do you do? You then subdivide by twos and assign this neuron this, at the second scale, this blue neuron to fire in the left half of the left half of the room and the left half of the right half of the room. So basically, this blue neuron fires brrr if you're here or if you're here in two different locations that are separated. Likewise, the orange neuron fires in two places. So this now, uh, and then you subdivide again, and then here's a blue neuron that fires in one, two, three, four locations, and the white, uh, the yellow, neuro, uh, orange neuron in one, two, three, four locations. I've also labeled them zeros and ones. Suppose the animal is here. This neuron, this blue neuron, this orange neuron, this blue neuron would fire, and you might call that the location zero, one, zero. And if you were here, it would be the one, zero, one location. So obviously, this is a binary representation of space, the kind of thing a computer scientist would be tempted to do. Notice it's a bit more efficient. It only requires six neurons. By the way, this actually much more efficient than a unary code. If you make the space much bigger, you'll get, you know, you basically squeeze out exponential uh, improvements depending upon this base. And of course, you can use other bases for this number system, right? You can use like base 10, you can use whatever base you want to represent space. Okay. Now, I'm gonna think about animal motion in two dimensions. Hold on. I'm gonna think about animal motion in two dimensions rather than one dimension. So I want to think about this kind of reasoning except in two dimensions. There was a question somewhere there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, that's a perfectly fine question. Divide by two if you like, uh, uh, and call it three. Uh, the reason I'm saying you need both is because there's a question of what silence precisely means, when things are silent and noise and stuff like that. So, and this is more like what actually happens to the brain in every location, something fires. That's because if nothing happens, then you know, there's a downstream readout. And the downstream readout has to decide what is going on. And silence sometimes has other meanings, like you're asleep or you're sitting in a corner. So there's a conflation with other states uh, is really what's going on. So, but as a pure coding thing, yeah, sure. You could divide by two. So here's a two dimensional representation of space. Now here's a unary representation. I have an eight by eight meter room. I need one by one meter resolution. So what do I do? I divide up into 64 squares and I assign one neuron to fire in each of the squares. In this way, you can get a place map for 64 neurons. Okay, you pay 64 neurons, it gives you back a placement. Now, here is the two-dimensional analog of binary numbers. I divide my room into four pieces, blue, orange, yellow, you know, green, in the four corners. Then I subdivide by twos, you know, like in this way. So if you're at this location marked as an X, then this is the blue, yellow, blue neuron. At each scale, you need four neurons firing in the appropriately same colored location. You know, there's these disjoint regions where they fire. 
So now with 12 neurons, I achieve the same resolution, you know, dramatically better than 64 neurons. And of course, you could use base 10, you could use whatever. So clearly, if I was a brain, if I were a brain, and I wanted to represent space, and I thought neurons and connections between neurons was expensive, it would pay me to use something that's more like some sort of base and number system, right? Which sounds a bit crazy that you would have a thing like that. Now I'm going to show you some data. So in 2005, the lab of Edvard and May Britt Moser discovered these uh, things that they call grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. This is how they work, okay? So this is a room, this rectangle is a room, and they're recording from one neuron in a region of the brain called the entorhinal cortex. And then the heat map tells you where the, well, how, uh, how, how loudly the neuron was firing when the animal was in the corresponding location. So these red, yellow dots basically mean that when the animal was on those locations, which by the way, lie on this gorgeous triangular lattice, now it's feeling more like a sodium chloride crystal. I feel better about this, right? I can understand this. Uh, so when the animal is sitting on this, la or, well, anywhere on this lattice of locations, this neuron fires. Now, it turns out, so here's a triangular lattice. Turns out that if you go to the neighboring neuron, it'll fire with a different phase. And together, the phases cover all possible locations at this scale of organization. Next, if you penetrate deeper into this part of the brain, into the entorhinal cortex, you find cells that respond on bigger lattices and bigger lattices still. And what's more, these jumps in lattice size are discrete. It's not like they smoothly increase from one size to the other. They jump from one lattice size to the other lattice size. So I ask you, doesn't that look like this picture I drew? I mean, it's slightly different, right? It's more fuzzy and, you know, it's more triangular and stuff like this. But doesn't it look the same, similar? So that leads you to hypothesis that the brain, long before humans did this kind of thing, evolution, invented, you know, number systems. And this is like a two-dimensional fuzzy neural number system. Would be a hypothesis you'd be, trend, you'd, be, uh, you'd be tempted to make. So how can you get evidence that this is the logic of it? So notice here, I'm not trying to develop a theory of self-organization of this. I'll say a little bit about that later that there's a dynamical attractor mechanism that could be organizing these things. But at the moment, I'm just thinking about the logic of this, right? Because, you know, uh, understanding the logic of the circuit matters for how you think it should be formed and should it be formed and, you know, what meaning is for the rest of the brain and so on. But thinking about the logic. So I'm going to try to find evidence for this in the following way. I'm going to say, I said, well, it could have been a binary number system, it could have been a decimal number system, it could have been anything. So I'm going to ask the, the, the following question. I'm going to say to myself, well, look, what is... I keep talking about this as a base n number system. Well, that's slightly misleading. Really, in the real system, what happens is that I have this scale of organization, then I have this scale, this scale, and I can take the ratios of these scales. And if it was a base two number system, the ratio of the bigger scale to this scale would be two. And the ratio of every successive scale to the one before that would be two. So if the ratios were two, this is like a base two number system. If it's 10, it's a base 10 number system. What's more, what's more, if you're actually talking about the real brain, there's actually no need for this base to be even integer. Why? Because the brain doesn't need to write down the number saying where you are. It needs to represent it. So it's perfectly fair to have base 1.3586, right? It, it is what it is, right? It's just the ratio of these scales. What's more, the brain is also not obliged to use the same base for every scale. It could be base 2 to start with, then base 5 later, whatever presumably is most efficient. Remember, I was trying to sell you the idea earlier that a theory of organization of circuits in the brain could be that the evolution drives the circuits towards efficient use of resources. So you might suppose that your theory here should be pick the base that gives you the most efficient circuit in the appropriate sense of efficient. Okay, so I'm going to go for what base would be most efficient to represent the world, okay? Kind of question that again, you know, as physicists, this seems like something that we can actually handle and it's kind of cool to do. It's just, well, certainly a cool question. And I think there's a working theory I have is that uh, I never try to work with important questions. It's a waste of time. I work with cool questions. And eventually, a good fraction of them turn out to be important, right? Because they were cool. So, all right. So this is a cool question. All right. So here's, here's how we're going to go after this. So I'm going to imagine things in one dimension again because it's a bit easier. And I'm going to observe the following thing. So suppose this is our basic uh, structure. I have some period for the first grid, then I have a second period and third period. And here's the grid as I was drawing it earlier. If the animal is here, it's the red, red, red location. Yes? The red cell fires, red cell fires, red cell fires. 
Now, an alternative location uh, organization could be I take the first grid, it has this structure, and I shrink it a lot. You know, I, I make this, uh, the, the ratio of scales to be much bigger, so it shrinks. Now, observe that there will be an ambiguity in your decoding of the location, right? The information is stored here in these responses. But if the red cell fires here, and the red cell fires at this scale, you don't actually know if the animal is here or here. So it's ambiguous. So having an unambiguous code, you know, a unique representation of locations, constrains the period of the second scale here to be larger than the width of the firing region at the scale above. So there's a constraint from uniqueness of decoding that you should somehow put in. You know, I'm gonna draw all my pictures like this, but you know, full disclosure, real neurons kind of fire in a more kind of, it's not rectangular, you know, the regions where they fire, there's more of a distribution, you should be noisy, so you should really be doing this in distributional sense with pro you know, probabilities all over the place. I'll say a word about that at the end, about how everything here ports over there and modifies the result a little bit. So I'll just say that in one slide later, okay? But bear with me, stick with me as I go through this sort of idealized version. Again, a very physics style. You know, you make up a problem that's really clean, so to get at the underlying logic of the thing, and then you decorate it to get to the real system. So being a theorist, I now need to formalize everything. So I'm going to formalize it as follows. So I'm going to suppose that I go from the dorsal to the ventral end, the two ends of the entorhinal cortex, you go from small scales to big scales. I'm going to parametrize the scales in terms of the period and in terms of the width of the firing fields as lambda i and l i. I'll, I'll get to you in a second, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to uh, parametrize it in those terms. I'm also going to, uh, uh, for the moment, I've drawn this as though there are triangular lattices, right? But actually, you should actually put in the lattice structure also as a variable here, because, you know, a lattice structure in two dimensions is, you know, it's some doubly, doubly periodic thing. There are two lattice vectors, and you can do this analysis with arbitrary lattice vectors too, but I'm not presenting that here. There was a question back there. Was that a question? Yes. Yeah, question. Can't hear a thing, I'm sorry. Now you're telling us about the fundamental coding of a 1D um, coordinate. Isn't it that there is different coordinate systems needed in the brain? One that is, for example, local, that addresses the motor coordinates, if I'm closing my eyes uh, for grabbing something, and the other one is the global one, which may be a map of Brazil or wherever. Yeah, sure. We're talking about local navigation in local environments. And now I've, I've learned from, I think, lecturing myself that the robotics people, at one point, they understood that the um, coordinate systems that were used for robotics in neuroscience were actually uh, numerically stable. And they were apparently matching with those that you had to use to make robotics problems solvable. And if you use the wrong coordinate system, mathematically, the, the problems don't converge in, sure. in sufficient time. Another question is, so there's, from this, I would expect there is a coexistence of different coordinate systems in the brain for different purposes. And there must be very effic effective uh, interconversion algorithms. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I think you're overstating the equivalence and the understanding you have of how they are the same thing. But there's certainly evidence of uh, the robotics people coming up with ideas that are reflected already in the brain. There's no question there are different coordinate systems for different things. But I will tell you that this very system that I'm describing, which is one of the coordinate systems of the brain, has been shown to be used by animals, including humans, when they navigate abstract spaces. So they've done experiments like they will present you know, pictures of uh, birds with different length necks and different shapes and everything. And then they'll ask people to sort of mentally navigate in the space in a certain sense to, to do tasks and you use the same things. So you clearly use these for other reasons too. But absolutely, there are multiple coordinate systems in the world. I'll mention just a tiny piece of that at the end, but talking about the egocentric versus allocentric coordinate system, there's also global coordinate systems, et cetera, all fascinating and all areas where there's a flood of data. This is a really exciting moment to be thinking about this. So thank you for the question. Yeah, but I'm gonna take this little snippet and talk about this. So, all right, so I've drawn these in two dimensions, but I'm gonna do the 
equations as if they're for one dimension, and I'll tell you how to modify them for two dimensions. So I'm going to parameterize this problem by talking in terms of a ratio of grid scale. So, you know, so basically I'm going to take this period lambda i over lambda i plus one, I'm going to recursively go down, and those are the ratios of scales because that's related to the base of the number system. Then I'm, I need to talk about the resolution of the grid. That's a behavioral requirement. And I'm going to parameterize by saying that the largest scale divided by the smallest scale, namely the number of pieces you can break the room into, is fixed by your behavior, right? You know, you need a, you have a range of so so big, and you need to have resolution up to some size. So, um, uh, as you can see, this ratio of the biggest to the smallest period is a telescoping product of the ratios of grid scales. Now, third, uh, uh, we should talk about the cost of the system. So, if you agree that the cost increases monotonically with a number of cells, then we should work out how many cells you need. Well, the number of cells you need is proportional to sum on scales of the number of phases you need, because you need, you know, uh, you need more phases to cover the world. Um, well, the, 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 the size of the period divided by the size of this firing region tells you how many phases you need in these cells to cover the world. So the number of cells is proportional to lambda i over li summed over these things. And then you have a constraint that lambda 1 is bigger than lambda 2, and so on. Now, now, this is a colloquium style talk. So, you know, in general, in colloquia, you're not supposed to use equations. You're supposed to just use pictures. The reason I'm writing this down is I just want to emphasize that a lot of this is completely practical. You can do this, right? I've taken, of course, the simplest version of the calculation to put it on the slide. But all of us can just sit down and do this. It's, it, it's, a, it's a moment of opportunity where this theory can be done that's practical and is doable to answer really interesting questions to the brain. And I'm trying to demonstrate that by just doing it for you on the, on the, on the blackboard, well, on the, on the screen. Anyhow, the, um, um, this is for one-dimensional grids. If you want to do this for two-dimensional grids, you should square everything uh, to be uh, um, uh, appropriately. Like, for example, the resolution should be the biggest area divided by the smallest area. If you want to do D dimensions, you know, I, would, I trained in PhD as a string theorist. So if I do one dimension, two dimensions, I can't help but do more dimensions like 10 and 11 and others. So, well, you can do this in D dimensions. That's fun. Um, so, well. In D dimensions, you'd raise these all to the power D. I'll tell you the answer for that later. So anyhow, so our goal is to minimize the cost, which is some function of the number of cells. So, and I'm going to assume it's a monotonically increasing function. So I want to minimize the number of cells required for a fixed resolution R. Yeah, so that's the goal. So we have a constraint coming from unambiguous decoding. And that was, remember, the period at the scale I plus 1, which is the period at the scale I divided by the scale ratio, must be bigger than the size of the firing region at the scale i. And you can massage this to write this as lambda i over li is bigger than or equal to ri. So do I do this here? OK, so now I want to point out something. Observe that this sum here, which I have to minimize, I need to minimize the sum. It, the summands are these ratios period over firing width, lambda i over li. And we know that for unambiguous decoding, lambda i over li must exceed ri, the scale ratios. So to minimize n, the number of cells, and the cost is a function of the number of cells, you can replace all of the lambda i over li by the scale ratios ri, because it's the smallest you can possibly get. OK? So now I've boiled this down to a problem. But here's my problem. I have a bunch of parameters, which is the ratios of the adjacent grid scales. I have a resolution that is fixed by behavior, which is the largest scale over the smallest scale, which is a product of the scale ratios. I have a sum of the scale ratios, which is proportional to the cost that I need to, well, the number of cells that I have. So I want to minimize n subject to the constraint that r is fixed. That you can do in like five minutes, last three minutes on an envelope, literally. And you get a bunch of predictions. And the predictions say, first of all, well, the scale ratios, the ratios of the adjacent scale sizes will all be equal. That's the first prediction. Second prediction is in D dimensions, the constant ratio you're going to get is, if you want to optimize this problem, is the dth root of E, Euler's number. So when my student, Shui Shin Wei, and I worked this out on the blackboard, I said, oh, that is so beautiful, but surely it'll be wrong or not apply to biology because nothing in biology ever works out that beautiful. But wait and see. So, you know, you got to get a little bit serious. To get a little bit serious, what you need to do is to recognize that at each scale, all these neurons are firing probabilistically. So if you collect a bunch of scales, you may know that the animal is in this location. Well, the black line may tell you a probability distribution of where, in some Bayesian sense, you think the animal is. Then the next 
uh, scale gives you evidence that the animal is in one of these locations, and of the green locations, these peaks tell you the probability distribution. You should multiply these together to get the real answer for the distribution over where you think you are. Again, there's an ambiguity constraint. If the scales shrink too quickly, this product of probability distributions will develop side lobes. So you, know, you, so you have to do the analysis a little bit more carefully to be more realistic. And, what's, and you, know, you should include the right amounts of noise and neurons and so on. And strictly speaking, you should also remember that in two dimensions, you can have doubly periodic lattices optimized over those as well. Anyhow, and if you do this, you find that you'll get you know, a triangular lattice. So here's what you get. So the simple model that I showed you gave you the square root of E in two dimensions. And the error bar here is a theory error bar showing you the 95% confidence interval from the theory. The fully probabilistic model, which is probably too complicated a decoding model for the brain, it's such a complicated decoder, it's very hard to imagine a neural circuit implementing it. It's actually easier to implement this one. Uh, would predict a slightly smaller scale ratio. And again, there's the 95% confidence interval. These are two data sets that were available at the time we wrote this paper. As you can see, they agree beautifully. This is hundreds and hundreds of cells. There's an even newer data set that came out uh, 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 last year from a lab in Cambridge. Hundreds and hundreds of cells smack dab on right on this red line. So this is really grand. Personally, I think it's amazing because it would suggest that evolution invented sort of base N or base square root of E number systems and optimized them for neural hardware. So I find this very interesting because we used a rather simple efficiency principle, uh, apparently to explain the organization of a complex circuit supporting a cognitive function. Now, Jefferson, I'd like to ask you, I started at some time, and I don't recall the time I started at, so I'd like to know how many minutes I have left. Sorry? You have been talking for almost 50 minutes. So have minutes. Have to yeah, you, you have 10 minutes. OK, so great. So I will take 10 minutes. So naturally, I have more than 10 minutes worth of material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a schematic of the next part of the talk, and then we'll get to the conclusion. Um, I'd appreciate a two-minute warning, so then I can just go to my conclusion. So I just described what I believed was an optimization principle that described the logic of this grid system in the brain. But actually, as it turns out, um, these grid patterns form in this sort of robotic sense that was being discussed earlier when you enter a new environment. So you wander into the environment, initially you don't have a grid, and then as you wander around, the grid forms in about 30 minutes. So it's self-organized in some way. And it's clear that it's uh, uh, tied to outside cues because if you put a red card in the wall and then move the card, you know, your entire grid will rotate with it. It's also clear that somehow you don't need sensory input necessarily because you can be completely in the dark and somehow you're able to path integrate your motion in order to be able to develop this sense of space. Okay, so how could you do this? So we're gonna do this by treating neurons as dynamical systems. And uh, you know, there's the very famous Hodgkin Huxley model which won a Nobel Prize. There's a leaky integrate and fire model which was written the same year as special relativity, which is another very cartoonish model. But for this audience, I'd like to tout the model of Professor Eugene Izikiewicz, which is your classic, you know, the five parameter dynamical systems model with you know, bifurcations, chaos, all this kind of stuff. And you can fix the parameters to produce any pattern of firing you've ever seen in a neuron. So if you like this stuff, you should go look at Eugene Izikiewicz's book and borrow his method. They're definitely worth borrowing. So we're going to borrow some of those methods. OK, so here's how we're going to self-organize the grid system, the whole thing that I said, using straight methods out of, uh, out of dynamical systems and physics. So here I'm borrowing ideas from a very nice paper by Yoram Burak and Ilafit uh, from 2009. And then I'll tell you how we can extend this. So here's the idea. So you have a bunch of neurons. This is in the entorhinal cortex. They're going to become grid cells in a minute. And I imagine that they have some external drive. So there's an input that comes in. And I'm writing down here, I'm accumulating the differential equation that describes the dynamics of the system. So R is the activity level of each of these neurons, right? And then there's a dynamical system we're going to write down to how this works. So we have all of these things. They're being externally driven. So all of them want to go like that. So that's, this is external input from the rest of the brain. Then I add to each of the neurons a local inhibition. That is to say, they, each of them tries to shut down its neighbors. It's a little bit like having a Mexican hat kind of thing where you inhibit all of your neighbors with a strength that decays with distance. Okay. So now you can ask yourself, if I run this dynamics, what's going to happen? Well, it's immediately clear that it's going to be a tractor of the following kind. Suppose a neuron fires, it's going to inhibit its near neighbor, so they'll shut up. But then the neighbor beyond that is disinhibited, so they'll fire, right? So they'll 
organize themselves in a pattern of firing. And you can imagine that the well-packed system of this kind is a triangular lattice. So that's indeed what happens. The, the, the dynamical attractor for such a um, equation is going to be the triangular lattice we earlier advertised. Next, but remember, this is a triangular lattice on the sheet of the brain. You, know, you see patches of the brain lighting up in this one. Next, observe that this system has a broken translational symmetry, right? Yeah, it's a lattice, so it's a bit discrete. But let's not worry about that. There was a continuous, uh, because there's a broken translational symmetry, there is going to be here a continuous manifold of phase shifted attractor states and kind of zero energy modes that allow you to translate. So the idea of Burak and Fee was to couple those zero modes to the motion of the animal. And then that way you could sort of shift this pattern around as the animal moved. So here's how you do that. You sort of couple the zero modes of the tractor manifold to motion of the animal, as I said. And then you can show that in this way, as the animal moves, so, so oops, suppose, oops, suppose I'm looking at uh, this neuron here. As the animal moves, the pattern of activity on the cortex moves. And because of that, sometimes this neuron lights up, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it lights up again. And if you work out what that does, this neuron lights up when the animal is physically in a triangular lattice of locations in the world. Basically, what you've done is the neural sheet in the head becomes a literal map of the world. The coupling between the zero modes of this attractor manifold and the animal's motion has produced an isomorphism between the neural sheet and the world itself. You are the world in some sense. Kind of really cool, very Borgesian somehow. Anyhow, um, um, that's, that's what you get. And so you get a single grid pattern. So because it's a physics conference, I'm going to tell you about one more thing you can do. That was one layer of this grid pattern. Remember, we need this discrete series, this discrete hierarchy. We need to self-organize a discrete scaling hierarchy of these grids. That sounds like the stuff that we physicists were made to think of. I'll tell you how you can think about this. This is work by a super talented student of mine, Louis Kang, who basically used ideas from soft matter physics to come up with the heat. He did this by an analogy with folds and curtains of all things. But okay, um, so this is the way this goes. So what you do is I first imagine that I have these different kinds of layers of the brain, of the, of the entorhinal cortex. And that, you know, you remember how I mentioned that there's this local inhibition that produces the grid by producing this kind of uh, every neuron shuts down its neighbors kind of, kind, of, kind of effect, right? Now, if you increase the scale of that inhibition, obviously the grid will get bigger and bigger because you know, you're shutting it down over a bigger and bigger range. So that's clear. However, if you increase that in some nice continuous way, then you're going to get grids that change size in some continuous way, OK? So these are just pictures illustrating that. They're kind of hard to see, actually, to see exactly because it's so fine-grained that there's a change. So, but how can you self-organize a discrete hierarchy? So here's a picture from Cheikh and Lubensky's book, Principles of Condensed Matter Physics. And this is something called the frankel kontorova model. So what you have here is you have a bunch of potential wells. And then you have springs that change their tension as you go to deeper and deeper layers. So you can either you know, stretch the potential or you can stretch the, you know, change the spring tension. And what you have is you have a push and a pull, right? The springs pull things together. And the potential minima push things apart. And it turns out that if you work out the possible phases here, the push and pull compete and lead to discrete jumps in the periodicity. And OK, so we can say, aha. The, the basic principle of the frankel kontorova model has nothing to do with springs or potentials. It's a push and a pull and the discrete jumps that happen when push wins over pull and so on and so forth, right? These, they're these discrete transitions. So we could apply that here. So here's what you could do. You allow the range of inhibition between these neurons to increase as you go deeper and deeper in the structure. So that's pushing this grid to bigger and bigger scales. But then you could add longitudinal excitation. Namely, you can allow the neurons in one piece of the sheet to drive the neurons in the other piece of the sheet and vice versa. So this would mean that this kind of interaction longitudinally in the circuit is trying to make things be at the same scale, layer by layer, right? So these green things are trying to make the same scale, layer by layer, and the inhibition is trying to push them apart. That's a push and a pull, right? You can work out what would happen. And by the way, the reason we're doing this is uh, it was experimentally observed that there are connections of this kind, but everybody was like, what's that for? Nobody knows what they're for. Well, we have a use for them. So we can stick them in. I'm going to skip this for lack of time, and I'm going to just come here. So it turns out that you can indeed get uh, 
Again, these things are hard to see here. So anyhow, you can get a discrete jump in scales. You get a scaling hierarchy as advertised. And it's very interesting, depending upon the ratios of the excitation and the inhibition, you know, how much push versus pull you have, you get these sort of very interesting phases where you get, if you look at the lattices of these grids at different scales, you get incommensurate lattices, discommensurate lattices, you know, uh, 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 all, uh, very, very, uh, I mean, I think it's an interesting condensed matter problem, right? I mean, for the, for the neuroscientists, they're specifically interested in one of these phases because that's what actually happens mostly in the animals. But, but you know, for us as theorists, it's kind of cool to think about this landscape because I think it's an interesting two-dimensional version of the Frankel Kontorova model, which famously has a devil staircase of phases and stuff like this. So there's sort of interesting problems to be done, and maybe they have a bearing elsewhere. Okay, so I must be like two minutes away. Okay, excellent. So that was self-organization. So there's experimental evidence for this involving the discrete grid orientations, the relative orientations are preserved across environments and things like this. So I'll just tell you that there's experiment, some experimental evidence is available for this particular mode of self-organization of this discrete scaling hierarchy of these grid lattices in the brain. Now, don't look at the rest of this. What all of this was about was, uh, I was gonna tell you a little bit about, so I'll just tell you, I'll summarize what the next bit was about. So, you know, um, that was about self-organization, but then there's also the world, and I told you how these grids are anchored to the world, and how if you stretch the world, you rotate the world, etc. So there's another kind of cell called a border cell, which remember I mentioned, fires at regions of the border. So now you can extend your dynamical systems model to say, in addition, there's a cell type that produces responses at particular locations of the model. Now we can introduce learning and say, suppose, suppose you allow those two things, the, the grid cells and these other cells, maybe I'll put a picture up, to learn connections between each other. Um, the re okay, it's hard to see. Anyway, I'll just go back here. So to learn connections between each other. The reason you do this is any kind of attractor model of this kind that I was describing to form these grids has, uh, is going to have drift because there's noise in the neurons and different kinds of things that makes the location of your map drift with time. And that's really not good if you want to know where you are in the world. So you'd like an error correction mechanism and a simple error correction mechanism, every time you touch the boundary, you phase shift back, you know, that's an error correction mechanism. But to do that, you need to learn as time passes through some self-organization, which, uh, which grid cell should be firing when you're standing next to this boundary. So you can again write down a dynamical system that does that learning and show that that mechanism of erasing the errors in this map works. That was that. Okay, that was a rapid summary. And so now let me talk about next steps perhaps most fun. So you'd like to self-organize the entire system from the border cells, from your sense of the border, from the head direction responses, and the overall network. You'd like to extend all of this work from simple squares and circles and stuff like this to complex naturalistic environments. Real animals, uh, including us, but definitely rats and what have you, live in these complicated burrows with shapes and things like that. Very little has been done about that, and there's a real, uh, there's a real need for people with the skills to do that. Then, you know, animals like us, and we see evidence for this in other animals too, are able to imagine abstract spaces, not just physical spaces. And there's evidence now through various uh, directions of research that you can uh, use the same structures to imagine those. You repurpose the same structures to do three-dimensional, four-dimensional, ten-dimensional, you know, shapes of animals, spa uh, shapes, uh, spaces of animal shapes, etc. How do we do that? Now, going back to a question that was asked earlier, there are actually different kinds of maps in your head. Let me give you just one example. So your experience of the world is egocentric. Egocentric means it's relative to you, right? You see things that way, you see things that, you see things that way, right? But the map I talked about was allocentric. It's anchored absolutely to the world. How do you convert egocentric experience to an allocentric uh, map of the world? Even more complicatedly, this allocentric map has to get translated back into egocentric action if you want to work in the world. So there's the egocentric, allocentric, egocentric transformation. So that's a project that uh, I'm currently working on with an experimental group to sort of piece apart exactly how you self-organize such a translation of maps from each other. Now, again, I want to emphasize that these, uh, there's something, you don't have to do things that way, or you know, maybe you do things differently. So there are three languages in, for example, in, in, in Australia, Gugu Yimitir, Kayadilt and Tayor, and I'm sure I pronounced those incorrectly, um, in which the users of these languages never use egocentric directions, right? So 
you wouldn't say, uh, so where's the ice cream store? Oh, to the left. They would say, it is to the north. Oh, I left in your house my, my, my hat on the table in the south of the east room. That's how you talk. So you never use the egocentric language, even though that's how you experience the world. Very, very interesting as to how that happens and why that happens. Anyhow, the bottom line here, this is the physics conference, is that I think this is a really exciting and really fruitful source of problems for um, some theoretical physicists and your neuroscience colleagues will be delighted to welcome you to think with them. You should go do it. Yeah, done. Thank you, Vijay. Amazing lecture. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Hi, yes, I have a question. I think it's a question about resolution. Uh, it's more like a feeling than a scientific uh, question. But I have the feeling that if I walk from here to there, I don't need to be aware of every position along the way, but just a few reference points or landmarks. So how does this uh, play along with the, yeah. the model? Excellent. Yeah. Excellent question. So, um, uh, so um, the first comment is that, uh, again, there are maps of different scales. So if I'm going to walk from here over to the other you know, the physics institute, you don't use this, this kind of spatial map the whole way. Indeed, there's a certain amount of wayfinding, a certain amount of you know, landmark-based navigation. I need to go there. But there's, a little, there's some of that that happens too. We're talking about here about navigation of familiar environments where you know what you're doing, and it's not exact. It's not large, uh, large Even with that, there's a question of what resolution do you really need? I mean, I don't need a millimeter resolution of this room. So, in classic theorist style, I abstracted that away by saying, suppose you have a resolution R that you need to achieve. I don't know what it is, but you tell me the number, and I'll tell you the answer. Of course, there's a sort of thermodynamic limit kind of thing, you know, large end limit kind of thing operating there. I assumed in the analysis that the size of the room divided by the resolution you see is a number that's much bigger than one. 10 is fine, right? Uh, but, but it has to be bigger than one, otherwise none of the analysis would work. So I'm, I'm, that's the kind of mode of analysis. Well, you know, we do this in physics all the time, right? So if you tell me what is the theory of sodium chloride, in fact, in detail, it's really hard. But you know, we abstract things away, assume the crystal is well organized, a particular way, think everything is a point, you know, the interactions are have a certain structure, and then you can get a kind of universal result. The details may matter. Did that answer your question? Okay. There is another question. So uh, we already know that our brain folds itself as a following a fractal rule, and also our neurons. Sorry, our, 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 our brain, brain, our brain folds, folds itself following some fractal rule and also our neurons are, are distributed like uh, following some fractals also. Uh, so I was wondering if you need to take some of fractality in account to figure out how your spatial imaging is formed or in your cortex brain. Okay. So, so uh, several things. So um, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, to be honest because I think that's painted with too broad a brush. First of all, I think you were talking about the folds on the cortex or something like that, because most of the brain is in cortex. The, co the neocortex is a very thin sheet sitting on top of the rest of the brain. Most animals don't even need much of a cortex to do anything. The hippocampal formation and all of this stuff are in the midbrain. Uh, it's not cortex, right? It's a much more ancient piece of the brain because remember all animals had to navigate vastly before they did painting, right? So, so first of all, emphasize that. Furthermore, um, the sort of these very broad rules, like you know, there's in some regions of the brain, there's a fractality to organization, or maybe the folds, or there are some neurons, not all by any means, whose neuronal arbors have a sort of fractal character because they're trying to cover space efficiently. You may be thinking about the Purkinje cell and things like this. So those rules don't apply, for example, those, those rules of neural arbor organization don't apply to all neurons. They apply to some neurons, which have certain functions to perform, like covering things well. Others will have, like there's the starburst American cell that has, you know, it makes its neurons like a, uh, its thing, uh, its dendritic arbor like a star. There's the pyramidal cell, which is the workhorse cell of the, of the cortex, the neocortex, which has this pyramidal uh, distribution of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, dendrites. 
some of them organize dendrites in a three-dimensional way, and some of them organize dendrites in a sort of flat sheet. Some of them organize dendrites in a line. So there's, so there's a beautiful, so let me just generalize your question. There is a really beautiful and interesting set of problems to be solved regarding that structure function relationships, because these forms of these specific cell types of the dendrites must serve a function. They're like that because it helps them do what they're doing. Almost nothing is understood about that. When I first entered neuroscience, uh, I was working with my mentor into the field, was, a, was an anatomist actually. Um, and his first question was, he showed me pictures of these neurons and said, why are they like this? Try to explain this. And this seems like a classic problem that someone in soft matter would be able to handle. You know, there's been beautiful work about you know, how these sort of fractal organizations, and other kinds of organizations serve very small world networks of things, serve various purposes. So I think there's a lot to be done here. Now, with regard to incorporating that here, it is a very good idea to incorporate the specific structure of the arbors of these circuits. Uh, partly that hasn't been done here because there's not enough information on it. As in, to do that, someone has to go through and fill the neurons with a dye and then image them. And then see and do some statistics of the shapes of these things and other things like that. So we don't actually have enough information on that to still incorporate it. But once we do, yeah. That will tell us a lot about how these circuits connect and what they work like. I don't think it's as general though as fractality does this, and therefore fractality affects uh, of the of the physical structure of the circuit affects the presentation of space. Of course, it would be gorgeous if it, that was true, but uh, it's not evident to me that that should be true. Did that answer your question? Okay. I thank you for your great talk. Uh, I'm. So I see your theory is most like uh, the neurons are firing or not firing. This is classical computation. So I wonder how some quantum computation would play a role there. And for example, I remember these uh, uh, twin photons. You have photons that were generated with quantum correlation. And if our two eyes would be able to see correlation rather than intensity. So, you know, um... As Jefferson alluded to earlier, you know, I have a second life as a high energy theorist. And it is one of the great regrets of my life that, as far as I can tell, quantum mechanics has very little relevance to the brain. Roger Penrose can say what he likes, but I don't think he's, just, he's not correct. It's just wrong. So there are some places where uh, uh, quantum mechanics does play a role, of course, in the brain. It must do. Uh, it plays a role in the biochemistry, but that's not what you were alluding to. It also uh, plays a role in you know, how things you know, fold at various points, you know, uh, protein folding and stuff like that, you know, clearly the quantum mechanics matters. It also plays a role in some sensory systems. So for example, photons have to be captured by the eye. So photoreceptors, in fact, use various kinds of quantum tricks. They, uh, uh, they have, uh, their structure essentially forms a kind of waveguide that traps a photon into them, but still not you know, using much quantum mechanics. But when, they're, when the rhodopsin molecule you know, changes configuration, uh, to produce the electrical signal at the end of the day. Uh, I believe it uses various kinds of quantum tricks. I'm not an expert in that, so I can't comment in detail. Mm -hmm. Another place where people have been lately talking about uh, a role for quantum mechanics in, you know, in uh, neural stuff is in magnetosensing, because, you know, that's a very weird and interesting sense. You know, pigeons can sense the magnetic field. There are weird, you, my son keeps sending me uh, odd pictures, like, you know, in the African savanna, all the wildebeest lining up north-south and standing in their field. Why would you do that? Right? Uh, but anyway, they do apparently sometimes. So presumably uh, they can, I mean, there are other cues like the, where the sun is, but anyhow, uh, supposing there's something magnetic there, certainly uh, butterflies can do this kind of thing. So um, one interesting idea about how that works is that so, uh, involves a kind of chiral molecule and uh, basically the transmission of electrons through this chiral molecule in the presence of a background uh, magnetic field. I read the papers that were very interesting and the transmission coefficient then depends upon the pitch of the spiral and things like this. I think it's very interesting as a problem about animal sensing and potentially eventually as a tool for quantum computation because by changing the pitch of the spiral, you can change the transmission coefficients and things like this. So there's something there. What you're really alluding to is you'd like something more interesting, right? These are all device properties uh, in the periphery. Wouldn't it be great if, you know, entanglement between this and that would produce, in, would produce an interesting effect. Uh, you know, you could imagine memory and things like this. And those are all very poetic thoughts, but I see no evidence that the scales are such 
and the level of noise uh, and decoherence is such that we're permitted such a thing. So I think that's sad, and I'll be very, very glad to be proved wrong, but I, that's what I think right now. Okay, so you have a, a very uh, a last question because we need to leave to the, the yeah. Institute of Physics, but there is still several questions and I suggest to talk uh, in private with Jay later on, but we still have a very, a, a very last one. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, I was reading recently about the, the possibility that the brain functions close to a critical point because the power law of the noise of the brain indicates uh, critical behavior. And that would be the answer to why the, the brain has this great efficiency, as you told in the first part in your lecture. I was wondering if you could comment something about brain criticality or something like this related to your results. Yeah, so again, I mean, there's clearly signs of critical phenomena and certain kinds of coarse grained observables. So, for example, if you look at overall distribution of firing rates, things like that, they often fall, uh, follow certain kinds of power laws. Uh, when you look at the phenomena of things like epilepsy, you know, you can see the signs of various kinds of power laws and, you know, in the, it's like, it, it, this is a runaway process. So it's like, you know, uh, uh, earthquakes and, you know, sand piles, you know, there's some, there's some power law, there are some tails and you know, things happen. Now, um, uh, many people like this idea because they think that uh, uh, precisely because, well, first of all, you know, it's sort of interesting and criticality has this character that it's on the edge of, uh, Know, it somehow it's very efficient in exploring many possibilities. A more ancient version of this idea involved what are called balanced networks of the brain. So if you look at cortical networks, they involve uh, lots of excitation and balanced inhibition. And the balance of excitation and inhibition can sometimes perch these dynamic, or if you treat these as dynamical systems, can perch them on the edge of chaos. You don't want them to be chaotic because then they're sort of uncontrollable, but you want them to be just on this side of that so that they are very expressive and their dynamical patterns express many things. So it's been a popular and interesting idea. There's another version of this called liquid state computing and things like that, uh, which I, I think they're all very interesting. Now, as a general theory, the brain is clearly inadequate. If someone will tell me uh, why criticality explains uh, how I develop a map of the world, I would be delighted. If someone can explain why and how objects like faces can be recognized uh, by the brain six synapses away from the eye with you know, two examples, whereas uh, with the machine learning, you need you know, 100 level deep network and thousands of examples, I would be happy to get the answer. But I don't personally see a direction to do that. I think it's, it's a cool phenomenon and it's true imports and meanings have not yet become clear. They will, I think, have uh, useful imports and meanings in two ways. One is involving the expressivity of the computation of the brain. I think criticality helps with that and possibly with some aspects of efficient use of resources indeed. But uh, I think that story is still developing, uh, an interesting thing to follow. Okay, let's thank uh, Vijay once, once again. And please head to the bus.